So don't tell your mind to anybody else other than you. Matter of fact, can I help you? You don't even need to tell God your mind because he's the one put it in you. You need to thank him for what he showed you about you. You don't need to keep telling God, ah, I'm praying about my car. I want a car. Lord, give me a car. Jesus said, wait a minute. Quit all that praying, that repetitious prayer. What you need to do is thank him for what he's revealed to you about you and what he's about to do for you. You see, I'm believing that God reveals to us what he wants us to be and to do, and we start praying about it. You don't need to, may I help somebody? When God shows you what he's going to do, he don't need no prayer. God don't need your prayer to make happen what he told you or showed you what's going to happen because it's already in existence. Your prayer, I know your prayers is powerful than God and his word. I know you bad and you all of that. Now, I'm not saying you're not supposed to pray, but you ought to pray the prayers that get stuff done. Most Christians pray and nothing happens because they pray amiss or they pray without understanding or they're not praying to God who can do something for them. But when you understand the power of prayer, and you understand the power of praise, I'd rather thank him for what he's shown me as opposed to pray about what he showed me. I'd rather thank him that what I saw is done as opposed to what I saw how it's going to get done. Did you get that? Oftentimes when God reveals something to you or shows you something inside of your mind, you start praying about it as if, he asked you to pray about it. He showed you what he was about to do. He don't need help. Matter of fact, your prayers will probably be opposite of what he's doing anyway. Because he's only going to show you a part. And most of what you will see will not be a clear vision of what he wants for you because he don't show you everything. That's what the Bible says. Now, let's go into Abraham. In the book of Genesis chapter 12, I need to read it, verse 16. The Bible says that Abraham, uh, uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 16. Let's go there right fast. Mm -hmm. Anybody have it? The Bible says that this man by the name of Abram had something. What is it he had? Sheep, oxen, asses, men servants, maid servants, she asses, and camels. You think Abraham was wealthy? You think sheep and oxen and asses represents wealth? Why? That's what they needed in that day. Now think about what does sheep do for you. You make your clothes. What does oxen do? Mm -hmm. What do men and women do? What do the asses do? And what does the camels do? So he had a bunch of cars. Everything Abraham needed in that day, he had. I submit to you that God wants you to be like, not, not Abraham, but Abram. God wants you to be like Abram. He wants you to have clothes. He wants you to have uh, cars. He wants you to have something to work. He wants you to have every single thing that you need. Now, I like the fact that God told this to Abram because it tells me that he told Abram, who was not Abraham, the Jewish leader. But he told Abraham, excuse me, Abram, who I can connect with, 
Because when I think about Abram, I think about the man who was not a Jewish leader, but who was the father of all. So when God blessed Abram, he was not Jewish. He was just a man that God used to bless and to prove that he could do what God said could be done in his life. Because God didn't see just the Jews, he saw me. Now, had the promise just went to Abraham, then the possibility exists that it would have just been to the Jews. But the fact that it was to Abram, Abram had all of his needs met. And now that Abram is a father of many nations, and I'm included in the nations that Abram is the father of, I decree and declare that my father Abram opened the door for me to have this power called wealth. So now I'm going to look at his life and follow my father, and I'm believing that I am going to become just like him. So, Genesis chapter 13, verse 2. <clears throat> now, Genesis 12 and 16 is a chapter before 13 and 2. Let's read verse 13 and 2. And, all right. Hold up, let's get the microphone. Now, Abraham was what? Very rich. He was what? Very rich. God wants you to know something about Abraham in Genesis 13 that he didn't tell you about Abraham in Genesis 12. And what is it? Very he was rich. very rich. So, excuse me, Abram. Abram was very rich. Read on. Now, in Genesis chapter 12, it says he had asses and camels and men and women and, sh and sheep. No, he didn't say he had silver. Oh, no, we're talking about Genesis 12 because I want you to see the difference between 12 and 13. And that's what we're reading now. Genesis chapter 13 verse 2 says what? Abraham was very rich. Why do you think God threw that word very? He had a whole lot of something that he did not have before. God has added a little extra to Abraham's wealth. And read on and he tells us. Now, Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. So what has God given Abraham in this chapter that he did not have in the chapter before? Silver and gold. And the Bible says the silver and the gold, <clears throat> the silver and the gold, hmm, silver, the silver and the gold, made Abraham something that he was not in the chapter before. Very rich. So something happened to Abraham that took him from just being blessed to very rich. And if you read the rest of the chapters, chapter, you will find that he had an experience. What was the experience? Hmm? He what? He went down into Egypt. And Pharaoh saw his wife, who was a beautiful person, and took his wife. And the Lord cursed him. And for Abraham, excuse me, for, for, for Pharaoh to get out from under the curse, he made Abraham a very rich person. He introduced Abraham to something called money, wealth, gold, and silver. Now let me say something to you. Gold and silver was weighed, but it had no value. So if you wanted to do something, you weighed the gold and you weighed the silver and you paid somebody off. It didn't have a particular value to it. We were told that this piece, no, the, uh, the, the other piece, 
of silver. You have the other piece of silver? This silver that's from Canada is you can go to Canada and you can take this piece of silver and you can buy groceries and whatever. It's worth about $5. The problem is you can use this because they place a value on it. And the value is about $5. But the cost of the silver is $14 at this time, $16. So would you go to the store and spend it? Why? Because you will lose the value, excuse me, it costs more than it's worth. So you can use it, and they'll accept it. They have placed a value on it. $5. But it costs you, it costs today, costs us today how much? $16. So that's not why I bought silver. I didn't buy silver to use it. I bought, bought it as an investment which two weeks ago, silver was where? So if you bought it two weeks ago and you got it today, it's gone up. You've made some money off of it. So what you will find in scripture as, as mankind begins to move forward, you will find that God begins to place value on money and men will begin to use money as value is placed on it. Now, what we did in America, we took money and made it paper and put value on the paper. And so you use the paper with the value. And the paper was supposed to be backed by the gold. Anybody listening? But now our paper is no longer backed by the gold. We make money, but we don't have nothing back in it. Because we have more paper than gold. Amen. So, something shift. Something change. And every generation, there's a change concerning wealth. Do I?